my great pleasure to invite Taj. Um, you know, we've known each other for a long time, but uh, I, I still have problems pronouncing his name. I'm well over 50 and I have problems pronouncing that. Or is it? Or is it? Or is it? Or But uh, really, um, I've known Ted for some time. But to, uh, to, to see the work that Ted has been involved in um, developing, if I may say, from bed bug analogy <laughs> analysis. <laughs> to huge global energy, uh, if not national energy issues, it is what we call an organic intellectual development of some supremacy. Uh, and that, well, it goes beyond that. I won't spend too much time introducing this gentleman because we won't have time for the talk. But it goes beyond that. It, um, it, his uh, little empire has, uh, um, has expanded so rapidly um, uh, that we, he, even, he even has a little precinct down in Adelaide in Australia. And so he's uh, truly transnational, global, and um, I, I think it's probably causing him a few headaches and keeping them uh, above it all. Anyhow, uh, in his, his part-time, he, he, he advises uh, the House of Lords Science and Techno Technology Select Committee on Energy and Efficiency. Uh, he's the co-author of uh, a number of papers, um, but one in particular that dealt with um, issues in the lance on energy and health. Um, he uh, has pr presented, as you would imagine, numerous public and academic lectures, uh, but more particularly for the Royal Society, the Royal Institution. Um, and it's, uh, well, I, I won't go on, but it just makes him uh, appear so uh, lofty that um, I won't go to talk to him again. Uh, but what we're talking today about is um, the, the, the premise that the U UK needs to undertake an energy efficient refurbishment uh, of its built stock in order to meet UK carbon emission targets. I personally have difficulty in following government policy on this, but maybe you can, you can uh, educate me a little bit. But the, the presentation will, will give a brief introduction to the importance of energy efficient refurbishment from a UK policy context and then explain some of the challenges um, that we face in undertaking a great British refer focusing, for example, on the domestic sector. Um, there's a note here, so you will also be prepared to spend the first 10 minutes of the presentation giving a practical demonstration of the greenhouse effect using my camera cameras. Uh, well, that's right, but I, I am ported it wrong, actually. Sorry? My, my party trick of trying to demonstrate climate change in a black bin liner, I'm afraid, <laughs> isn't going to appear to back. Oh, right, okay. Um, <laughs> Maybe another time. <laughs> okay. Well, enough for the introduction. So the only point I should say before I hand you over to Taj is that the focus is on this concept which is one for open debate as to what a mega project is, but we, we, we are struggling to sort of link this to the concept of mega projects, but then because it's open to definitions, I think, we, we, we're still in the, within the scope of the agenda <laughs> attached. Okay, well thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. Um, yes, I mean, my own personal is not mega projects in in uh, I think the traditional sense, uh, but I do believe that uh, the challenges that we face with uh, the, uh, the, the energy challenges, both globally and nationally, are going to lead to, to many very large-scale projects having to be undertaken at a scale and at a pace which we're probably not um, necessarily very used to, certainly in the sectors that I'm going to be talking about. And I apologise, I'm going to be referring very much to um, to the, uh, the great British uh, 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 sort of problem, in some senses, and the UK problem, uh, and uh, very much on the domestic side of things. Um, many of what I'm, much of what I'm going to be talking to about applies both to, uh, to non-domestic buildings as well as to domestic buildings. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about, obviously, the supply side of the energy domain as well, but I understand you'll be having presentations uh, later on about the supply side. So my own background is much more on the energy demand side of, of the problem, but I'll be linking that a little bit later on. Uh, so actually, I want to start with a little bit of history, um, and uh, none of you will be able to read this, but this is a, a scan of a, um, 
a fuel rationing book that I was issued um, when I got my first moped um, when I was uh, about uh, 18. And it's hard probably for many of you who are much younger to realise that actually we were talking um, in the 70s uh, about rationing fuel. Um, and uh, that we never actually introduced the rationing, but we were right on the brink of rationing uh, fuel here in the UK, and also many other parts of the world were thinking about that. And that's really when we started to talk about, at least in, in, in the last 50 or 60 years, when we first started to take energy efficiency seriously, and started to promote and introduce policies and legislation uh, to promote energy efficiency in almost all the sectors. Uh, but as you can see, globally, um, both myself and my colleagues had absolutely no impact uh, in terms of trying to reduce carbon emissions uh, over the last uh, 40 years or so. Uh, we were carrying on increasing our carbon emissions, uh, despite having introduced lots of policies, developing lots of technologies. And so part of what I'm going to be doing is, is to try to reflect on why we haven't achieved perhaps as much as I personally would have liked to have achieved. And then I'm going to go on to talking about uh, what's the challenges for the future. And uh, this is a scenario that the International Energy Agency came up with to try and reduce carbon emissions to what was considered a safe limit uh, of um, uh, you know, only trying to achieve two, two degrees global warming. And uh, you know, here they would, they've looked at what trajectory would have been if we, if we don't take any action, and then uh, looking at the trajectory we ideally need to follow, uh, which is obviously radically different to anything that we've done in the past in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, and they've attributed uh, certain wedges of this to savings in certain sectors, and I'm going to be talking about the built environment, uh, which is, you know, at least a third of the, uh, the savings are supposed to happen. Uh, and almost any future scenario for a developed country where they're looking at trying to tackle climate change uh, ends up with a similar solution that you need to. Um, uh, but a significant proportion of the reductions in carbon emissions is going, is, is going to be attributed to buildings. And these are just some of the sort of things that people say. Moment worldwide, there's 40% of all primary energy is used in buildings. Uh, in the UK, we're committed to an 80% reduction in carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, our carbon plan uh, states that by 2050, all buildings will need to have uh, an emissions footprint close to zero. Sorry, that's got reformatted. formatted. Um, so yeah, that's a major difference from the current situation that we've got out of the stock in. Uh, currently, UK homes are responsible for about uh, over a quarter of UK's greenhouse gas emissions, um, of which 80% is used for space and water heating. So, still in the UK, we're largely our energy consumption is dominated uh, in the domestic sector, and within the domestic sector, it's dominated by space and water heating. Uh, and of course, 70% of our homes in the UK, and this is where it's quite a big difference <laughs> from uh, many developing countries, the majority of the UK homes will still be here in 2050. So it's not an issue which we can look at doing things to new buildings purely, which is where a large part of the focus on energy efficiency over the last 40 years have been new buildings. If we want to reduce carbon emissions by 2050, then we've got to tackle the existing building stock. When we do the, uh, the cost calculations, so the cost effectiveness calculations of improvements to energy efficiency in buildings, generally they come out better or as good as almost anything else you might do. So in terms of you know, compare it to the wind turbines uh, and decarbonizing the supply, uh, the cost effectiveness of energy efficiency improvements are generally thought to be much, much a better option to buy into. And so something that generally when you do these calculations, you say you should do that first, and then you should do all the other more expensive things that then tend not to, uh, to, to pay back. And then, of course, as well as uh, you know, our current preoccupation with our doubt, so it's trying to reduce climate change and reduce CO2 emissions. Um, but there are many other good reasons why you might want to improve the built stock anyway, um, uh, for comfort and health reasons. We, have, we still have, in the UK, up to 40,000 people uh, dying every year cold, um, and a large proportion of that is attributable to the poor condition of our built stock. 
this isn't people just slipping over and uh, in the, on, on the ice and, and, and dying. Uh, this is people who have um, uh, cardiovascular problems, uh, where, and where if they live at temperatures below 16 degrees centigrade, then they're more susceptible to health-related problems, which can then uh, result in, in, uh, in, 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 in them dying. So, you know, it's a major, major problem still. Uh, and of course, security of energy supply is something that I think we're all worried about as well in the longer term. And you know, as our own uh, reserves of uh, particularly gas have been running out and oil, uh, we're increasingly dependent at the moment on fossil fuels uh, from sources that politically we may not be that interested in uh, retaining good relationships in the longer term. Uh, obviously, there's not only interest in this in the UK, but obviously uh, the European Council has set targets of 20% energy efficiency improvement by 2020. Uh, the buildings have to deliver that sort of target as well, so there's a lot of pressure from European legislation. Uh, it appears that we're not doing very well at, at heading towards that target at the moment. We're presently not on track to, to deliver these, these targets, and so there will be increased um, efforts to to try and put, bring us back on track. These are just some of the historic quotes of what sort of various uh, government departments have sort of been saying. Uh, UK committed to environmental goals, including the 20 times by 34% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so you know, we need to do a lot there. Uh, the Secretary of State, Chris Hume, before he uh, had to disappear, uh, you know, recoup committed to a radical program of domestic energy saving, determined to clean our supply of energy, launching a revolution in energy efficiency, a once in a lifetime retrofit for our outdated homes to make them fit. Uh, and both the transport and heating is becoming clear that our future will be electric. So not only are we talking about trying to reduce significantly the energy consumption of our existing buildings, but we're talking about switching over from the current energy infrastructure which we have at the moment which is largely uh, a mixture of gas and electricity, um, a, bit, a bit of oil, a bit of coal, a bit of nuclear, um, switching over almost exclusively to electric, decarbonizing the whole of the electricity supply, um, and I'll give you some, some examples of what the UK is, is attempting to do in a minute. Uh, in fact, this is a slide. This is the carbon intensity here that the government is looking at for its electricity. Uh, over the next uh, sort of 20 years, really, that we're talking about. But by 2030, we would have largely decarbonized that whole electricity supply system. Um, and so that means moving over to nuclear and renewables uh, and moving away from fossil fuels, or moving into carbon capture and storage, uh, and actually achieving these large reductions uh, with carbon capture and storage gets increasingly difficult. Um, so uh, a major change in our energy supply system, as well as a major change uh, in our energy demand uh, that we have to do uh, in stock. And uh, these are the targets for uh, reduction in energy demand. And of course, we're predicting our population to grow over the next few decades. So there are very good reasons why we would expect our demand to increase rather than to decrease. Uh, and these are the sort of budgets that we've set ourselves for the uh, residential sector, which is the blue and the non-residential sector here, both of which are predicted to decrease for time, even though we will be building more buildings and adding to the stock over the next uh, 20 years. So some major uh, improvements that we need to do. Uh, let me just uh, now just talk about what people are talking about in terms of technologies. Um, and there are loads of options in terms of achieving these sorts of targets. It's perfectly feasible to achieve most of the, 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 the targets using uh, these technologies, improvements in efficiency, <coughs> both for the fabric of buildings, for the fabric of walls and windows, uh, various forms of ventilation and heat recovery, various more efficient boilers, uh, heat pumps, uh, maybe uh, combined heat power systems, solar systems of various sorts. All of these technologies have been around since the 1970s. So when I said that's when we started to get interested in energy efficiency, um, I'm not aware of one completely new technology that anybody's talking about that wasn't around and discussed in the 1970s. 
So what you have to think about is, for the last 40 years we've had these technologies and we've not reduced our carbon emissions. It's very, very unlikely that we will develop a completely new technology in the next 40 years because we haven't done it in the last 40 years. So we're probably stuck with the existing technologies we've had. What are we going to do to actually implement these and make these work? That's not to say these technologies haven't evolved tremendously. I mean, photovoltaics are you know, much more efficient than they were. Our boilers are much more efficient. Our double glazing is more efficient. There's been an evolution of these technologies, but there's no completely new technologies that people have come up with. OK, so one could argue that we can build a zero energy building. Here is a zero energy building in the most harshest climates that you could possibly imagine. We can do it. We have the technology. Uh, the technology in some senses is not the problem. Um, I, I, when I say this is a zero carbon building, this is obviously a zero carbon building. Um, it wasn't zero carbon to get it up there, but when you, <laughs> once you've got it up there. Um, but the challenge is really how do we do this on the earth at mass scale? And that's something that is uh, quite a challenge. We have done it on the earth. Uh, this is a low energy Victorian house which was refurbished partly by people from UCL, uh, where we successfully uh, looked at reducing the carbon emissions by 80% um, through refurbishment. And you can build what are called zero carbon, but actually not zero carbon, uh, but close to zero carbon buildings. Uh, um, but these have all been done on small scale. Uh, the slightly depressing thing is that, again, uh, this is another zero carbon building which was built and demonstrated in 2008. Uh, we built a similar building in 1985, obviously the design is different in the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the way it looks, but in terms of thermal performance, in terms of its carbon emissions, it's exactly the same. Uh, so you know, what's actually developed over those, that 23 year period, um, the one thing that hasn't developed is that these haven't become standard and, uh, and, and adopted. So the challenge is really how to de deploy the appropriate technology to 24 million dwellings within a very complex socio-economic system to, uh, to reduce carbon emissions by 80%. And what I'm going to now spend a little bit of time is, is just talking about what, why this is perhaps more complicated than we might think to achieve these targets um, and when we're actually introducing this on a mass scale. Uh, we do have more than enough evidence that the technology alone just does not deliver what we need, although technology is incredibly important in all of, in, in all of this. Before I do that, I just want to spend a little bit of that time just talking about why people find it difficult to understand energy. Um, and uh, well, I'm sure you've all uh, covered energy in various parts of your course, and probably at, at, at school. Um, but it becomes quite difficult when you're actually trying to understand the energy consumption of a building. How, how do I really know that this building is performing better than a building down the road? Um, and how do I know if my building's not performing well? It's actually quite difficult to be able to understand that. One of the reasons is that at the moment, certainly in the UK, most of our fuel bills are very erratic. Um, the, the sort of analogy with the transport sector is, is um, you know, the way we bill for energy consumption at the moment uh, is similar to if you took your car down to the garage and filled it up with petrol and uh, then went to pay for the petrol the guy said, well, I'm not sure exactly how much I'm going to charge you this time. Um, I've only got a vague idea about how much petrol you actually put in your car um, and I think I'm going to charge you this this time and I'm going to charge you some other number the next time. You find it very difficult to manage the use of your energy in your car, if that was the case. Well, that's exactly the case at the moment with fuel billing. Um, you know, most people do not pay uh, as they use the energy directly. There are people estimate the bills. And at the same time, you know, you have a lot of variation. Um, you know, one, you can't compare one winter to the next to the next winter because it might be colder, so you might be using more energy uh, because the building and the heating system has become less efficient, or you may be using more energy because it's colder outside. So actually to work out all of these things is actually quite complicated. And then you've got fuel prices changing. Um, you know, we've actually had fuel prices historically dropping, not increasing at all. 
and still um, actually the percentage of our income that we spend on fuel in the UK is significantly less than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Um, you know, it was about 4 to 5 percent of our um, sort of in income that we would spend on fuel. Um, it's more like 3 percent at the moment. And so, you know, in, in real terms, we haven't actually, the fuel prices still haven't got as high as they have been historically. And it wasn't that long ago where actually we were spending more in the UK on alcohol than we were um, on, uh, on, on fuels, which sort of, you know, puts it in a sort of scale of, of, of importance, you know, it becomes that sort of almost disposable thing that you're not that worried about. That's not to say that there aren't significant people who the, the fuel expenditure is a significant proportion, but for the majority, it's not been a, a major proportion. And just to give you some idea, you know, how lucky we are at the moment with fossil fuels and how cheap it is, um, uh, if you had to actually power the average UK house with people power, so in other words, we got some really good athletes, the sorts that went to the Olympics, and we stopped them on bikes with generators, and we used all, took all of their energy and used it to run our houses, then we need about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people working flat out at Olympic rates of about 400 watts, completely flat out, 24-7 for the whole year. And if we actually had to pay them the minimum European wage, uh, then it would cost us 400,000 pounds per annum to run our house. Uh, whereas it costs less than a thousand pounds for lots of people to, to, to run their house at the moment. So, you know, the, uh, the tremendous benefits that fossil fuels bring us at the moment in terms of reduced cost of, of running things is just, uh, is just phenomenal. And the, the, the way we use energy in a building is actually quite complicated and, and it interacts in all sorts of ways. You probably can't see the detail here, but, um, you know, you, your heating consumption can go down because you can be, you have more people in the house generating heat, or you can be using more electricity for your computers. So if you increase the number of computers, your space heating might reduce because your computers are generating lots of heat, which might actually be useful. And that sort of interaction makes it quite difficult to understand very often what's going on. So the just going back to the sort of Great British Ring firm and some of the challenges. Um, you know, that we're going to try and introduce and refurbish all the houses. As I explained before, a large proportion of the houses, these, are, these will be the, the new houses that we might be building in the future. Um, so these will be built to whatever the regulations probably specify. But then we will also have to refurbish the existing housing stock over the next uh, 30 to 40 years, and that's uh, a, a major challenge. On one level, it's actually quite simple. So this is a picture of, uh, I think this is Buckingham Palace somewhere here. What is it? Buckingham Palace? Yeah, that's Buckingham Palace. So just to give you some idea of scale. What we're talking about is spreading that amount of insulation around every single, around all of the houses in the UK. So if you took one cubic kilometre of insulation, <laughs> we just need to spread that thinly over all of the houses, and that's largely <coughs> sort of the job done for the fabric of the building. We have to do something similar with replacing windows uh, and you know, with, with boilers and the ventilation system. But on one level, it's quite a simple task, but actually to do that and insert that level of insulation across the whole building stock is, is complicated. We are having lots of policies uh, to try and stimulate the market to do this. I won't be going into the detail of the potential savings, but we have various obligations on the suppliers of energy, we have building regulations, we're going to introduce things like smart metering in every house by the end of the decade. Uh, we have various policies for products that will make sure that your uh, various technologies that you install will be energy efficient. There are various community action schemes going on. Uh, we're going to make all new homes zero carbon by 2016. Uh, we have something called the Green Deal, which will enable you to get access to loans, uh, and we'll be incentivising the use of renewable heat, solar energy, heat pumps, and things like that over um, the next few years uh, by giving uh, an effect and a financial incentive to do these things. So there's lots of policies that uh, the government uh, is, uh, is looking at introducing, uh, which will help us supposedly meet the current targets. But again, I just want to look at a, a historic reflection 
on things and move away from what theoretically might be possible to actually what we have really experienced. And uh, this shows you the energy consumption per year uh, for houses for heating, in effect, through heating through gas. Each one of these triangles is about a thousand houses, and it's, real, it's the real data from a thousand houses. Uh, and it's plotted for those thousand houses at a particular age of construction. So this data is all for the same year, uh, but the houses have different ages, ranging from houses built in the 1920s through to houses built in the 1990s. And in the 1970s, we started to introduce building regulations, building codes, to try and make our buildings more energy efficient. Um, well, I guess what can you conclude from this diagram? Well, there are still some houses that have been built even quite recently that really aren't necessarily performing any better than houses in the 1920s. So why is it that some of our older houses are performing as well as some of our newer houses? even though these newer houses have supposedly been built to standards that are much, much more higher than we would have uh, expected. Um, right. How many of those houses are in conservation areas, so they have to be suited to the same ones? Uh, this, this is actually data from Milton Keynes, actually very... Well, some of, the, some of the houses will be in conservation areas, but actually tend, they tend to be in the older categories, the pre-1900s. Um, so it's not really so much the conservation, um, although that would make them have a higher energy consumption than expect if they had not done to them already, then you'd expect perhaps them to use even more energy. I mean, theoretically, we would have expected um, the, the, the consumption to something like that to be a, a very steep curve. Instead, there's a lot of scatter, and uh, you know, this is quite an optimistic straight line through the end, I'm saying, with a not very good correlation. The target we set ourselves is to be zero carbon for 2016. So, you know, we've got a big challenge to move from something which is sort of very vague and wishy washy where we haven't really achieved a great deal to something which is actually now very uh, challenging. Uh, and with the Great British Reefer, what we're talking about is actually moving the energy consumption of all these houses uh, down to something which is probably at least half of what they're currently consuming. So it's quite a sort of challenge to do that. I'm going to skip that graph. Um, what I want to talk about now is, is one of our, the refurbishment projects that we have had already, to give you some examples. It's not been as deep as... Um, uh, ambitious as what we're going to have to do in the future. It's not achieving the targets that we have set ourselves for future energy efficiency at all. Um, so we've had a scheme in the UK which is called the Warm Front Scheme where uh, anybody on a low income can in effect get free insulation and free heating systems uh, installed uh, up to a, a cost of uh, several thousand pounds. Two and a half thousand pounds for uh, the heating repair or replacement, one and a half thousand pounds of, of insulation. Whereas actually, the Great British Reefer will probably cost per house about ten thousand pounds. That's the sort of level that will probably need to be invested. Um, so, this scheme has been going on for quite a long time. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's done a quarter of a million homes in the UK, we've got 260, 226 million homes. When we were lucky enough to get some funding from the government to monitor the impact of these schemes, and what we found was that the temperatures in these houses had increased, which was good news because part of the motivation for the wall front scheme is not just energy efficiency, it's actually to eradicate fuel poverty, to make the houses warmer, um, and to increase uh, the temperature is a good thing. It improves comfort, it reduces fuel costs, it reduces mould in the houses, improves mental health. Why would increasing, why would introducing energy efficiency improve mental health? I suppose because you're not physically ill as much. And physical illness is correlated with mental health. Uh, it could be, yes. Yeah. Any, any other? You say you save money and spend it on the stuff you want to. Uh, yes. 
can be the case, that's right. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is that uh, what tended to happen, I mean, you know, these were generally uninsulated houses with not very good heating systems. Some of them didn't have central heating, so not every room was heated. So, um, you know, you could be, you could have been a pensioner in the house, uh, you know, you've got an old boiler, you're worried about whether your old boiler is going to survive the next winter. Somebody comes along and they give you a brand new boiler, which is probably going to outlive you, so suddenly you've got less pressure to worry about. The other scenario that you can have is, you know, perhaps you've got a single parent family, um, you know, mum's quite stressed, uh, you have only got heating in one room, you know, but during the cold periods, the whole family is living in one room, uh, you suddenly insulate the building and you install central heating, suddenly all the rooms are heated, you know, not all the kids are now having to do their homework in the one room, they can go and do their homework in other rooms, uh, the stress levels just generally reduce because you're not having to be cramped into one space. So there are some reasons, but we were quite surprised by this result, and um, uh, there's some quite interesting stuff that has come out on issues related to, uh, to mental health. And also, if it's reducing mold growth, you know, you don't feel good about yourself if you're living in a house which has just got horrible black mold on all the walls. Uh, but what does it do to the energy? Well, actually, the energy consumption rose by 34%. Uh, whereas theoretically we had expected the energy to reduce by well, roughly that, that amount. So we would like to hazard a guess as to what went wrong in terms of uh, reducing the energy consumption. Is it partly like you say they're eating more rooms then? Partly they're eating more rooms, that's absolutely. So this assumption very often that uh, people like myself who come back come, come at this problem from a physics background. Um, simply look at it from a purely physics problem of, you know, you're just adding insulation, everything else is going to stay the same when you've added the insulation. That doesn't happen. It doesn't happen with any energy technology, really. Uh, there are always different changes in human behaviour, in the way people interact with systems. And we've had very little understanding of the impacts of that historically. Um, but it's an incredibly important factor. Um, the ironic thing is that it was discovered by uh, Jevons, who uh, was an alumni of UCL in 18, uh, I think it was something like 1860 or something, uh, when he discovered that actually as you made steam engines more energy efficient, coal use increased rather than decreased. Um, so the Jevons paradox has been around for a long time, but it hasn't been fully understood. And the direct ways in which you can have an impact. Uh, I'll give you another example of that later on. Um, we hypothesized three reasons, and I just want to briefly run through what these three, three reasons are as to why, theoretically, very often buildings will end up using twice the amount of energy that we expect them to. Uh, sorry, in practice, they use twice the amount of energy that in theory you'd expect them to. Um, and it's, it's interesting from a policy context because. The policymakers in this area have loved to work with theoretical energy savings. And in fact, I would say that the energy policies over the last 40 years have been almost totally driven by theoretical energy savings rather than any actual energy savings. You would like to have a guess as to why policymakers like theory rather than practice? It's easy to make up the numbers. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Theory always gives you the answer you want um, because you can utilize the sort of theoretical approach um, to adjust the theoretical approach until you get almost the numbers. The problem with uh, measuring anything, evaluating anything, is you almost always um, shows you something you had not expected from a policy point of view. That's not necessarily good news. Um, so historically, uh, almost all of the policies have been based on theoretical calculations which suggest that if you do X, then you get this saving in energy. And normally you don't take account of things like the Jevons paradox at all. Um, you assume that everything else stays the same, and you get this, this, this reduction in energy use. That has actually changed in the UK and there's been a major change in the way that the government is approaching some of these factors in the UK. It hasn't happened in, in many other countries, and recently we know it's the States. 
um, see the difference in, in, in some of the approaches for a whole host of reasons. But um, because we now have legally binding carbon targets, people are interested in the actual carbon emissions now, whereas previously they weren't interested in the actual numbers. Um, they have carbon budgets that they have to achieve, and they realize that they can't carry on to say things are getting better, but with carbon emissions rising. And so it has brought down quite a bit of reality, um, to the extent that we bizarrely now have incredibly long discussions with many civil servants and many of the economists um, about the U values of solid brick walls in the UK, which you know nobody except for a very small elite group of anorak lovers has ever before talked about. Um, but uh, it has, like I say, changed things quite dramatically. There are three reasons that basically we can explain this as quickly once you run through this. Um, we apply the physics very often wrongly. Um, I have to, whenever I give this presentation to, people, to economists in the civil service, I have to reiterate that physics is always right, unlike economics. Um, <laughs> it's just that you might decide to apply the laws of physics. There isn't a building yet that we have found that breaks the laws of physics, um, but we might have chosen to apply the laws of physics wrongly to that building. I don't think that applies to economics. Um, we've not built or refurbished as often we've modeled or we've expected theoretically things to happen. And we don't understand very often how people change their behavior as a result of energy technology. <coughs> so, to give you one example of applying the physics incorrectly, um, we had assumed that when you go and uh, install insulation in somebody's house, and you install draft stripping around the windows, that the air change rate, the leakiness of the house, would be reduced, and therefore you would have to heat less air up, and so you'd save energy. Uh, when we actually did tests to measure the leakiness of houses, we were surprised to find that uh, actually uh, the leakiness only changed a marginal amount, it only reduced by about 4%, where we were expecting sort of figures of uh, 15 to 20% of reduction in the leakiness. Um, when we split the cell block into those with central heating, those without central heating, we found that central heating seemed to have an impact on the leakiness of houses, which none of our models had ever previously um, uh, thought about. Why would installing a central heating system impact on the leakiness of the house? Because if people get too hot, they open the window. No, actually, it's much more basic than this. This is, this is actually this. This is the leakiness even if you close all the windows. This is the leakiness of doing a pressure test. You put a fan in the door, you shut all the windows, and you just measure the leakiness. Does it increase the rate of circulation of air? Does it? Does it make air? It force it to move? No, no, it's, it's much more cruder than that actually. Because what happens is you have one group of people who go around and draft strip the house and seal up the windows. And then you have another group of people who come in and put the central heating in. Uh, and the first thing they do is they drill holes through the floorboards, drill holes through the walls, and it's much more leaking. You know? Now, I mean, you know, it sounds so obvious when you say it like this, but none of our models had even thought about that as a factor. Um, and so, actually, the houses were no more leaky. Um, uh, sorry, no more airtight, really, or marginally more airtight than they had been in the past. A more extreme example of applying the physics wrongly is, is an example that a colleague of mine, Bob Lowe, who works in the Energy Institute, recently discovered, um, which is that they built some new houses, uh, which were supposed to be exemplars of what the next set of building regulations would, would, would insist on in terms of an energy efficient house. When they built these houses, they found that they lost twice the heat that they had expected. And you know, they were diligent, they, they made sure that people were installing the insulation in the walls so they knew it wasn't the walls were leaking. And after some forensic work, they discovered something that when you do a calculation of the energy consumption of a house, you measure around the outside of the house because that's where the heat is lost. If it's a terraced house or a, a semi-detached house, you don't measure the party wall because you assume that both houses are heated and there's no heat loss through the party wall. 
And in fact, up until 20 years ago, that was exactly correct, that no heat was lost through party walls. But 20 years ago, we introduced acoustic regulations for all new houses. And those acoustic regulations insisted that the party walls, the walls between houses, were in fact cavities and not solid. And so this is a cavity before they put the outside uh, brick. So we're looking at a house, there'll be one house here and one house here, and this is the cavity. And what happens is that the heat comes in uh, from adjacent houses and rises between the cavity and up into the loft space and heats the loft space. And it's above the insulation then, so you lose the heat. Now you might think this is an insignificant factor, but it actually doubles the heat loss of the house. It means a terraced house loses more energy than its attached house, <laughs> uh, which is completely contrary to what everybody has been, uh, has been thinking of. And you know, it isn't that we haven't known that chimneys worked like that, that if you have this big stack, you know, we've, we've modeled chimneys, but we just hadn't thought about applying chimneys to this because previously they were solid walls and so and we had changed the way we did the calculations. To solve this problem, took one small change in the building regulations, costs five pounds a house to do, and like I say, it doubles the energy efficiency of the house. But we haven't really discovered this because we haven't, we've been living in a theoretical world and not a real world. And we've been doing that because actually getting access to building energy data was quite, quite difficult, and trying to interpret data was quite difficult. But uh, that position is now changing. We've been lucky enough in the Energy Institute that we now have access to every single individual gas and electricity meter data in the UK. Uh, so we know how much Buckingham Palace uses in terms of its energy performance, and you know, how much uh, you'll be using in, in your houses. But obviously, we're not meant to reveal that to some official secrets. Have to do that. Um, but getting access to real data is becoming this just shows the heat leaking in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the loft space. The other thing is obviously the buildings often aren't refurbished as you think they are, a lot of the wall insulation is missing. Now some of that, you know, we, we're very good at blaming the construction industry in the UK. Um, that's normally the target of their um, sort of uh, complaints. But actually sometimes it's just physically very difficult to get 100% of the wall insulated or 100% of the loft insulated. Um, but what is particularly bad is actually how bad some of our new houses are. So this is just looking at the measured heat loss of houses. And we would expect all the houses to be here. Um, and this is the increase over the calculated heat loss. So some houses have twice the heat loss, but you know, the majority is probably has about 50% times the heat loss of what we would uh, expect. So there are massive improvements that we need to have in terms of the way people install the technology and implement this. On one level, it's simple things, but on another level, to try and get this to work en masse at a reasonable price is a challenge. Uh, let's skip that, actually. Um, and the final reason, then, is occupant behaviour, uh, which we've already talked about, the fact that people take the benefits of increased uh, insulation as, as rebound, and it's called take back and comfort or even take off, you know, in some cases people actually don't live in a more comfortable temperature, but they actually live physically more comfortably because they take more clothes off, they don't sit around in jumpers and things like that. And people just interact with complex systems in complex ways. And the example of the warm front scheme that we had was that the scheme paid for new central heating systems to be installed in lots of houses, which are more efficient um, than the older schemes that they had. But the scheme was not allowed to take out the old system. And many people just carried on using the old system. Now, why would you do that? Why would you carry on using the old system? Well, maybe you have got used to it. You, know, you didn't understand the new system. Maybe you thought it was actually going to be more expensive because it's using the whole house. All these other reasons. So a lot of the things that you might expect people to do, they don't necessarily do. Um, most of reasons. Uh, well, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with this. This actually tries to summarise what can actually happen in a house. This is what theoretically you expect to happen to the energy consumption of a house as you make it more efficient. 
So the, the efficiency increases. Theoretically, you'd expect the energy consumption to reduce. Um, and this shows you for a sort of typical average behavior of a, of a house, which is that you heat it to 21 degrees and you might heat it in two periods. If you decide to heat it all day long and you heat the whole house all the time, uh, then this would be your energy consumption. Whereas if you decide to heat it, only partially heat it, heat it to the lower temperature and heat it for a few hours, then you follow this trajectory. And what tends, you, we assume that theoretically people just move in this direction. But actually, there's nothing to stop somebody deciding when you improve the efficiency to move out here and actually take a large proportion of the benefits as improved comfort, higher temperatures, heating it for longer. But eventually, you get to a stage where actually they have to stop reducing energy consumption. And what we would argue is that doing small changes to a building, improving it just a little bit, most of the benefit is probably going to be taken as comfort taking in some form or other. Whereas if you do big interventions, it's actually you get to a point where people just can't heat it to a higher temperature because they've already heated the whole house. They're already, heated, they're already living at 24 degrees centigrade. The only thing they can now do is to throw open the windows and really throw the heat out or something like that. But you know, as you progressively insulate more and more. And so actually, you're probably better off doing one house really well if you're trying to get a real reduction in carbon emissions or a real reduction in energy efficiency than doing many houses with just little interventions. Uh, and that sort of message hasn't really got through. Um, the last example of human behaviour I want to give is, is this, which actually was an MSC study project a while back um, that was done uh, uh, here at UCL. Um, this was to study the energy consumption of, of the beloved domestic conservatory in the UK. And we, we, we love domestic conservatories here in the UK. We, put up about 100,000 of these every year, um, and um, <clears throat> they, you originally got a credit in terms of your energy performance. You got a better energy label for your house if you had a conservatory. You would like to have a guess why, why conservatories reduce the energy consumption of a, of a building? Greenhouse. Yeah, greenhouse, and what, so what, what is it doing? It warms the air. Yeah, it warms the air in here from the sun. Some of that air may permeate into the house. That puts an extra barrier over the building. And for some of the time when the temperature in here is, is, is pleasant enough, you can use this space without any active heating. So lots of calculations, lots of theoretical calculations to show how um, this sort of technology could be retrofitted to existing houses and could reduce the energy consumption by about 15%. What we actually found was that the majority of people heated their conservatory. Uh, and as soon as you heat a glass box, you can double the uh, energy consumption of the house if you, if you heat it to the same temperature as the rest of the house. Uh, the MSC student surveyed nine houses with nine conservatories and found that nine of them were heated. Um, so we then did some back of the envelope calculations to show that the, the negative impact of that was completely, completely offset the changes to the building regulations that the government was planning to do. But obviously before they must have taken any action, they wanted a much bigger survey, so we, we did a survey of 5,000 conservatory owners where we got them to complete a detailed posting questionnaire of 100 questions about how exactly they used their conservatory. Um, and the most staggering result of this piece of research was that we got a response rate of, I think, something like 46% to a posting questionnaire of 100 questions. And uh, what this says is that conservatory owners are the sorts of people who will fill out questionnaires. <laughs> um, if you want to have a postal questionnaire filled out, send them to conservatory owners. Because yeah. uh, they're that sort of diligent person of people. But what we found was exactly the same as we really found before. That uh, two thirds of people said that they heated their conservatory. A third said they never did. But when you looked at them, their responses to other questions, they either left the doors open between the conservatory and the house when they had the heating on, so they heated it indirectly, or they didn't have any doors at all between the conservatory and the house, and therefore they, whenever the heating system was on, the conservatory was really just part of the house. Um, and so 90% of people do need that conservatory, about half of them need it quite a lot. Um, we were then off, asked the question by the building, by the, the policy makers, okay, you found this increasing energy consumption from conservatories, what should we do to stop this? So we were arguing with policy makers, we found a, an additional source of uh, energy use. What, what will you do to stop uh, increasing energy consumption in conservatories? I think, I think 
gap between the conservatory and the house. Yeah. What was that? Uh, you mean put a door between the conservatory and the house, make sure the door's closed? Yes, that's. I mean, <coughs> that has has happened as a regulation. Double glazing. Double glazing. Uh, why not make sure they're all double glazed and then we'll use less heat? So, what happens? We look at the results of the energy consumption for houses which are single glazed conservatories. These are the number of hours, and you can't see here, but this is the, the predicted energy consumption. Um, whereas for double glazing, it's twice the energy. So. Exactly the opposite to what the physics will tell you. you know, the physics would say double basic conservatory, you halve the energy consumption. In fact, the opposite is happening. Why, why is why are you using twice the amount of energy in double basic conservatories to single basic conservatories? Because you know that a single glazing the energy will go out, so then people won't eat it. Yes, psychological. So well, people, almost. These people will go out in the winter and use them because they know there's as hot because if they're heated, they're as hot as they are as if they're inside. And so they can look out and see the nice snow. And yeah, the, the the reality is it's actually almost impossible to heat a single glazed conservatory and be comfortable in the middle of winter because the radiant temperature will just make it so cold. And even if you've got the air temperature up to 21 degrees, <coughs> you need a 10 kilowatt heater, which would normally blow most of the fuses in the house to do that. Um, Whereas as soon as you double glaze it, suddenly you can actually heat it. And you can watch TV in the middle of night, in the middle of winter, and still be reasonably comfortable. Um, and actually, we could have saved loads of money. We could have avoided doing all of this research um, if we'd have simply gone to the people who flogged conservatories and talked to them. Because if you go and talk to the people who flogged conservatories, the first question they ask is, do you want to sit in bed in the middle of winter? But well, if you do, you've got to make sure it's double glazed. Because otherwise you're not sitting in it. Um, now, so we went a long way round to finding that answer, um, but it's completely counterintuitive, and it just shows the importance of the people playing in this whole equation. So, you know, we think we might know what to do with the technology, but if we don't really understand how the people are going to really interact with it, uh, then you can completely uh, misunderstand things. So, actually, if you wanted to reduce the energy consumption, you'd actually ban double glazed conservatories and insist you only have single glazed conservatories because then people would use them as buffer spaces which they'd only live in, in, be in, in in those periods. But, but now what people do is, is they use them as habitable spaces, um, partly because of planning constraints <laughs> which allow you to have conservatories. Can I just ask something on the human factor? Most people that I know who have conservatories use them as smoking areas. And whether this is... Uh, has it increased or decreased after the smoking ban? Uh, well, we haven't got the evidence. That'd be really interesting to see that. Um, certainly, I think there's some very interesting stuff to be done on the impact of smoking bans on uh, energy consumption, particularly in pubs and things like that, Absolutely. where, of course, now everybody has outside radiant heaters um, to, uh, to accommodate it. And yes, you know, so there, there are some very interesting social aspects to all, all of this. <coughs> And of course now you can buy, well in fact they were giving away air conditioning units for if you bought a, a conservatory. So you can now not only heat your conservatory, but of course you can air condition it um, as well. And, and the most recent survey we did on conservatories showed that about 10% in London were air conditioned as well in some form or other. So um, the, uh, the ability, the innate ability of the human being to come up with novel ways of using energy should not be underestimated uh, at all. In uh, I'm going to skip that. Um, one of the biggest changes that has actually happened over the last 30 years um, is obviously changes in demography. We're getting much older. Um, we're therefore living alone. One of the biggest factors that dominates the energy consumption of an individual is whether they live with several other individuals or whether they live on their own. Um, we had, in fact, tried to persuade the Department of Energy and Climate Change that most useful way for them to spend some of their money would be to invest it in marriage counselling um, because if only we could persuade people not to split up from each other and actually live together then actually the energy consumption per person would reduce quite significantly um, but in fact what we've been doing is actually living in bigger spaces or largely because we've been living on our own um, uh, uh, and as both as people get older but also as as uh, divorce rate has, has increased, um, so you shouldn't forget the social dimension of the. Of the 
I talked about the UK, I just thought I'd stick in a slide which talks a little bit about uh, the fact that we're not alone here. It's not, although we try and beat ourselves up about it, it's just the fact that the UK doesn't understand anything uh, and can't do anything properly. Uh, and that also it's a problem in the non-domestic sector. Um, you know, this is a building which was built as an energy efficient building in Germany. Um, and when it was built, it used twice the energy consumption that, it, that, that people had expected it to. Um, after four years and replacing the whole heating system uh, in the building, uh, at great expense, they eventually managed to get it down to its target figure. Um, but you need a lot of efforts to, 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 to do that. Um, I don't want to sound depressed here, but it can be done. We have had buildings which are energy efficient and which work well. We just don't do it on the big scale. And we're not quite sure why things fail when we do them on the bigger scale. Um, we've got some hypothesis, but we don't know exactly um, why it is. Um, and just to put on this graph here, you know, there, had, there was a small group of houses that were built say, in, in the 80s that had energy consumption down here. Uh, there's a whole estate of houses which were built in the, in the 80s which had energy consumption down here. So we can do and achieve the targets that people uh, uh, but can it be done at scale? Can it be done with normal occupants? Can it be done without several PhDs and professors involved? Uh, can it be cost effective? Um, uh, very often uh, there are challenges with the refurbishment of buildings. If I go in to refurbish a building and make it more energy efficient, but what happens when you discover other problems that are associated with the building at the same time? Um, that, that can incur additional costs. So there's a particular challenge for things like the Green Deal. We're giving people a loan to encourage them to uh, improve the energy efficiency of their buildings. But then um, what happens is they start that process and they discover all sorts of horrible things in their building. And then they have to spend more money. Where are they going to get that money from? Who's going to give them a loan for that? Uh, there are some serious technical challenges which we haven't overcome yet, particularly to do with the bridging. To understand better about how uh, very often uh, insulation is bypassed. I won't go into too much detail on that. Other than to say, uh, we think it is possible for you, for instance, to improve and refurbish your house and to cause mold growth next door, even though you've not touched their house. Um, so, you know, there's some serious possible challenges there which we haven't fully overcome. The risks of not getting it right are massive if we're going to do this. Um, and uh, there was an energy efficiency program in Australia where I think they had four fatalities and something like 20 house fires. The fire back uh, after the insulation. Yes. Yeah, so, one of the, so some of the deaths were uh, due to uh, people in fact, standing on foil backed insulation stapling the insulation to the rafters and going through the electrical mains when they were standing on foil backs um, things. And then the other thing was that um, there were downlighters in the ceiling which were being covered over with insulation and these downlighters were then causing fires to occur. Uh, but this helped, I think, uh, topple the government in Australia. It was one of the contributing factors. Um, because they have a whole whole scheme and massive uh, impacts. And so the UK is incredibly concerned about this. There are also other unintended consequences of, of adding insulation. And one of the big ones is possibly overheating houses. And um, it's probably going to be the case that we really only want to do these refurbishments on a large scale if we insulate. And we also put things like shutters on the outside of our, our, our windows so that we can allow ventilation to reduce the overheating risk, which is likely to happen as global warming occurs anyway. Uh, the risk of missing our carbon targets, and um, uh, there are challenges to do with the electrification, and I just want to finish on this really, uh, is that what we're talking about doing in the UK is we're talking about replacing all of our power stations, or a large proportion of our power stations, with renewables and nuclear. We're talking about moving our heating system from gas boilers to uh, heat pumps. And we're talking about insulating the stock at the same time. If we do these things out of phase, then there are potentially major problems 
So, for instance, if we all in, if we all install heat pumps in our houses today, then actually the carbon emissions would rise because heat pumps are only good if you have decarbonised electricity. If you haven't decarbonised electricity supply and you're using heat pumps, then it's no good. If you install heat pumps now and you haven't insulated your buildings, then the peak energy consumption of those heat pumps will be so high that you'll need to replace all of the electricity infrastructure from your house to the power station. Because our electricity system can only cope with one kilowatt of electricity on average, we'll be using four kilowatts um, if you install heat pumps for now. So you need to do these things in a way which is quite well phased. So for those of you who might be interested in project managing big projects, there's a definite uh, uh, usefulness for that. I'm going to stop there with this slide really. I still think it's the greatest century, a challenge of the century. We do need big changes. It's not going to be easy, it's not going to be cheap, but it probably will be cheaper and easier than lots of alternatives. Uh, it's more expensive than people have talked about before, but that's no different from any other technologies. Wind turbines are turning out to be slightly more expensive than people thought. Nuclear power stations always cost more than we thought they would do. Um, it requires quite a lot more social and technical advances. We need real verification of things. Smart meters are going to help. Um, we're probably going to end up having domestic MOTs, so our house will have to have an MOT as well as our car. Uh, it is going to involve major and rapid changes in the whole supply system. I mean, at the moment, we really do not have an industry that can do a 10, 10 billion pounds per annum uh, refurb, and that's the sort of scale of things that we need to do. Um, the refurbishment will have to go in hand in hand with other policies, just doing the insulation. People will, if you don't increase the fuel price at the same time, people will just use the energy on other things. Um, and we need to be incredibly careful about health and the impact of climate change. I'll skip on that. Um, lawsuits. One of the reasons why we're not very good at building energy efficient buildings is that nobody has ever been sued for building an energy inefficient building. Um, this is the, one of the few attempts in the states where they're looking at suing a scheme rather than individuals. Uh, but it's been very difficult to, um, to, uh, to do that. And you know, why should the construction industry take anything seriously if they can't be sued for it? So, uh, that's sort of a rather bleak picture. I'm going to skip through these because this is very interesting thing like this. Uh, but I did want to finish on that, which is again a reiteration of our innate ability to think of novel ways of utilising energy. Um, and part of these have been motivated by energy efficiency. Several of these are in Milton Keynes. Um, that's in Milton Keynes, and as is that, as that. And Dubai loves to copy what Milton happens in Milton Keynes. Um, and the, this is rocket science. Um, lots of people say this isn't rocket science. It is rocket science. The reason why one of the shuttles fell to Earth was because somebody engineered out the vapour barrier in the insulation. And we're very likely to do the same, uh, but on the earth, with more catastrophic events. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chad. Um, it's actually always very sobering to be reminded how the success of the macro depends on what happens at the micro. And you can have a huge project. That you know, the electrical system of Northeast United States of America go on for this one particular power station knocking on. So it may be that there's no apparent thing between the micro and the macro, but actually worrying the need so that there is. What we usually do is it produces, and I should have done that right at the beginning, yeah. we can quickly do that, just essentially name uh, the country from the course you're taking, um, just so that we all understand who's there. So, uh, to be sure. Okay. But, um, thank you. Yeah. I'm Linda. I'm from China and I'm doing the Mahat. Hello, my name is Lynn. I'm from doing a Mahat student also and I'm from Canada. Mm -hmm. I'm a Mahat student also. My name is Michael and I'm from Greece. Mm -hmm. My name is Ian. I'm from Ireland and I'm from my Mahat. It's all right. I'm going to send you. Let's just see from the jet line. Thank you, Kelsey from New Zealand. Carlos from Moscow, my path. 
Sono ancora un uh, Peter Jones, Center for Transport Studies, UCL. <coughs> Marco Dina, from Italy and uh, Omega Center. I'm Alex Moore, from UCL. Uh, Philip Gates, good civil engineer, Peter Press, Celsius. And also, uh, I have a student in this way, I'm from China. Uh, wait, that's Okay, questions? Um. Eric, can I start with an observation? You asked the question, you asked, is this a mega project? Yes. Um, well, one of the modules that I teach is called the management of large projects and programs. And there are lots of things in common between the management of very large projects and the management of a program of a large number of small projects. And I think there's, there's a, that's a, one of the connections. One of the connections here is the engagement with and management of stakeholders. And I think you, you've proved that absolutely wonderfully with, with the, uh, the tales of all the people who were supposed to be benefited. Um, and, and, and somehow, or rather, it, both from the energy point of view, the energy suppliers, the energy demand point of view, the consumers point of view, um, and it all, it somehow didn't work like that. Because no one actually, or few people actually, found out what people who were going to use the energy were, uh, might, might be up to. Um, and as you said, they used the theoretical data. Um, but, uh, as you observe, economic theory does tell us that if you make a good cheaper, then you can either relate to consume more of the good or to consume something else. And I think, particularly with your warm front, people elected to choose more energy, and having discovered this and the benefits of this, they actually stuck with it, even to the point that it made a higher level of energy consumption. I mean, I don't know that I offer that as a... Yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. I mean, we've got the empirical evidence for that in some senses. Although, in, this, in that case, they did actually save energy. I say money, sorry, and this is something that sometimes people don't. Money and energy are not always the same, even if, if the money is for fuel. Um, because what happened in some yeah. of these houses is that they were switched from an electric heating system to a gas heating system, and gas is much cheaper. So you could be using more energy, but because you're using a cheaper energy, um, you could uh, still save money but use more energy, which is sort of counterintuitive. I think just picking up on the point that you were making about the little levels of detail and the stakeholders, um, we've been working with um, some large contractors who are getting into this whole industry of refurbishing houses on a mass scale. <coughs> and um, the, you know, one of the sort of anecdotes as to the most successful, the, the key element to making a successful housing refurbishment has been designing a way to attach the satellite dish to the scaffolding during the refurbishment process. Uh, without that, the uh, complaints that they got from the stakeholders was just phenomenal. Uh, uh, well, this warm front believe very invasive techniques in terms of they, they were quite disruptive. No, no, the warm front ones weren't. The warm fronts were very uninvasive. But the, 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 the sort of more deeper retrofits particularly on solid wall properties, which is the, the main... We've done the easy things in the UK. We've filled the cavities that are easy to fill. You can fill those for 250 quid, um, and it has a significant effect. Um, we've replaced most of our boilers with more efficient boilers, and we've insulated a large proportion of our lofts, and we've done quite a bit of double glazing. What we haven't tackled is the solid wall houses, which are much more difficult to do because you either have to install, install internal insulation uh, which is very intrusive, or you exter external insulation, and the uh, satellite dishes is where you install external insulation, you put scaffolding up um, so that you can attach the external insulation, and of course you, you've got to somehow move the um, uh, satellite dish for a period of two or three weeks while you're installing that. Um, so you go along and see this quite weird scene of scaffolding with lots of satellite dishes attached to the scaffolding. <laughs> Is there, is there any plan, like, uh, I don't know, I'm having a small population, a, place, a village somewhere in the UK that actually this implementation of the new energy can be done and then can be measured 
Yes, I mean, that's exactly what is now being planned on quite wide scale. So we're working with an organisation called the Energy Technology Institute, <coughs> which is part funded by the government and part funded by the major utilities, um, BP, Shell, EDF, Eon. And um, they're in the process of doing a uh, planning for a, uh, a demonstration project of 10,000 homes. Um, and uh, also the government, as it's rolling out various policies like the renewable heat incentive, is starting to do much more evaluation as it's going on. And what we're trying to pioneer in, um, is, is, is much more of a, <coughs> a, a different way to do research in this sector. Because the Warm Frog project that I was explaining was a, a very successful research project that we had. Uh, we published about 12 academic papers. We got a paper in The Lancet, one of the most prestigious journal. From an academic point of view, it was, it was a complete success. From a practical point of view, it was a complete disaster. We took six years to find out that people drilled holes through the floors um, and that we weren't getting the energy savings, but we didn't know why we weren't getting the energy savings exactly. Um, and you know that takes six years. And, you know we're trying to talk. We're talking here seriously about trying to tackle the problem by 2050. You know we can only afford a few more of those sorts of six-year experiments before we run out of time and the problem needs to be fixed. So not only is there a real challenge for the um, the, the sort of construction industry and the skills base and things like that, but there's a real challenge for the research base in this sector to find new research methods which actually meet the time constraints that there is on this problem. And so we've been looking at much more action-based research methods where we work with the con contractors on site rather than taking this you know, purely academic thing and we're just going to stand there and observe and not interfere in anything. And we're just going to watch what you do and you know, just find out whether you do anything wrong, but then we're not going to tell you whether the next sort of you know, six years. That sort of approach has got to, got to change. And that's actually quite a challenge for the funders of research. Um, you know, it, it, traditionally, if you applied in our, in our area with an action-based research methodology, um, you wouldn't get any research funding. Um, you know, now that we're gradually winning those battles, but it's been a long, long battle to get people to accept that you can do research and that we have to do research in a, in a slightly different way. You, you were saying there that a lot of the technology is around since the 70s. Yeah. Have you approached? Um, manufacturers and suppliers to maybe offer incentives to advance the technology so that you get better? I yes, I mean there's lots of, um, uh, particularly organisations like the Technology Strategy Board have funding to, uh, to help manufacturers uh, develop uh, technologies, particularly in this sector. And um, how successful that funding is, it, it has been is yet to be proven. Uh, but there has been government funding to incentivise companies to uh, to increase the rate at which they're developing their technologies in these areas. The big one that everybody's really wait, waiting for is, is actually thinner insulation, um, or a way of easily insulating um, the, the, the buildings, um, which doesn't cost ten thousand pounds per house to externally insulate a, a, a house. Uh, you need to reduce that cost quite quite significantly too. I do need to get it to take up. And you know, there's all sorts of creative ideas. We're, we're, we're um, talking to um, some people in, in UCL who are keen on um, looking at whether you can grow moss on the outside of a, of a house um, and that that moss will trap a pocket of air. And so, you know, to a certain extent, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of free way almost of inserting your house. Now, I mean, there are all sorts of challenges to do with the moisture absorption of moss. And, like that and how long it will survive and what it will look like and all these sorts of things. But it does involve, you do, I'm not saying we, we don't need creative people in this area, we do need creative people to, to rapidly advance the, the areas of, uh, of deployment and innovation in this sector. But what I don't think we can do is we can't gamble on there being you know, anti-gravity invented that will um, just reduce heat loss from houses tomorrow like that, or your confusion. Taj, I'm interested in your estimation of what it will cost per annum. It talks about a £10 billion worth of expenditure to keep yeah. this, this refurbishment going. I mean, that's, that, is that figure just based on observed 
uh, cost so far? Uh, well, it's based on the sort of figure that you're probably talking about ten thousand pounds per house, yeah. um, and that's that's at the peak of what people will pay as well. Yeah. Well, yeah. people, how much they're, they're prepared to invest in this. What interests me is that this is a massive problem, so there's certainly potential economies of scale from delivering absolutely massive the, the, units of yeah. refurbishments and. Yeah. Maybe there's the scope to revise there's, that figure. There's massive scope for that, yeah. and there's a lot of interest in, and, and a lot of potential for harming that cost, I yes. suspect. Because if you actually do, uh, we've worked with some, um, some um, people who look at sort of systems integration and yeah. designers of systems, and, and um, you know, if, if you actually look at the material costs, it's not, it's not the fundamental material costs, it's, it's the it's chains deep. of contractors yeah. and, 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 and the way that we do things. Yeah. So for instance, at the moment, for internal insulation, there's been some work to, uh, which has reduced the time of refurbishing a room to, to under a day, um, whereby what they do is they, they laser scan the, the walls, uh, and then they off-site um, uh, sort of cut the insulation to yeah. accurately fit the wall, even if it's uneven, so that you can literally just send contractors in yeah. and they just slot it in, exactly cut. They haven't got the wastage on the site, they haven't got to clean up after themselves in the same way, you know, it, and it just reduces the time massively, yeah. and you know, the, the acceptability of that is much, much better because you're not, you're not losing your room for. You know, yeah. And there's just a coordination issue, is it? Yeah. Because if, if, the, if the government can mandate this sort of, some of this activity, contractors can be working on location that and do a whole street yeah. in a coordinated way. So, yeah. well, obviously, is, is this is this refurb is this refurb of Britain going to be the result of a of a free market? Is it going to rely yeah. on single households to, to yeah. demand this refurbishment, or is yeah. it going to be some mandate yeah. from government? Yeah, and there's whole debates about uh, whether the best approach is street by street yeah. or simply replace when uh, when a, an individual house chooses to or needs to um, to do something. And obviously there are pros and cons of both of those approaches um, and all sorts of innovative things that people are looking at. So, for instance, where you might choose to go street by street and um, uh, Externally insulate the facades because it, it, because it looks very old when you just have one house which is externally insulated. But you may not be cost effective to replace everybody's windows at that same time because yeah. you, you might want to wait for the lifetime of those windows to, to come to an end and then it becomes much more cost effective. But you can develop a system which enables people to then extract the window easily from, from the, the thing and then replace the new window when they need to. Yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's work going on in, in that. So there's this sort of innovation in terms of the system integration and, and actually the whole process uh, that, you know, there's, there's masses of work to be done in this and potentially quite much. Thanks. Uh, 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 because uh, I'm keen that we generate intellectual links between dealing with the micro and the macro challenges that the micro is embedded within. Um, I just have one statement to make vis-a-vis -vis mega projects mm -hmm. that um, reinforces the overall concern that has been um, highlighted <coughs> by you. But then I have three questions mm -hmm. I'd be very pleased if you could respond to. But one of the major uh, conclusions from the Omega research with regard to mega infrastructure developments, uh, an international study well, was without doubt that one of the major challenges would be retrofitting existing mega projects. I mean, there is a lot of thought, uh, a lot of splash about new mega projects. But actually, the real challenges and innovation lie in the in the retrofitting. Um, but in, in in retrofitting, here comes the um, the crunch. Is that retrofitting? needs to be guided by policy, priorities, and directives, unless you think otherwise. Um, now, that then leads me on to the three questions. Um, how is it 
the politicians, let's just confine ourselves in the UK for the moment, can be so fickle about changing the policy directives and policy emphases uh, without really uh, appearing to, to, to be held responsible for the implications of policy switches overnight. It would almost seem with, within, I mean, we just had wind farms being declared um, inefficient or whatever it is. Or we, we had Osborne um, some months ago saying that the energy policy needs to be secretary of economic growth. So, uh, with all this intellectual investment being put, if politicians can be so fickle and do policy switches, which is supposed to direct investment, yeah. how, how can we move forward? Because that, that is an issue now. Uh, the second question relates to um, the point I raised earlier on. How imperative is it for mega infrastructure decision making to understand the detailed dimensions of the engineering and operations um, or putting it another way to what extent is a knowledge about the detailed operations and activities clouding innovative thinking about out of the box so there are two sides to looking at this. Um, and the final one, that actually the lit. Where does the source for policy formulation come from? I mean, you made much of the point it needs to be evidence-based because theoretical based policy formulation can actually lead to major investment errors. And, um, so there are three questions. As you can see, I'm, I'm trying to link the micro with the macro um, because this actually is a huge problem within this field because you know, the, the macro guys think you know, the micro doesn't matter, the micro guys think only oh, yeah, the micro matters matter, and, and there is this tension. So I'm all ears. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, they're all difficult questions, uh, as I would expect. <laughs> um, uh, the fickle policy thing, I think, is, is incredibly destructive to the industry. I think you know, it's, it's, it's one of the... You know, industry is perfectly happy dealing with complicated, difficult problems, provided it has a clear direction that the government can set it. Um, you only need to see the horrendous um, uh, impact that uh, you know, the two policies that I would say in, in my area, <coughs> which have, um, have seriously challenged industries, the feed-in tariffs for photovoltaics. So, you know, there was a very heavy subsidy for, for, for photovoltaic installation in the UK, and that was hard or, or, or overnight. Now, the government had decided that it was planning to reduce that anyway, and the industry was preparing for that, but to do it early, um, just completely killed uh, a, 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 an industry which was ramping up and preparing for certain things and just killed it, well, killed it completely for it. Um, and the other example I would give is, is the, um, uh, the issue of zero carbon homes, which was a policy which was announced almost completely on, on the hoof. Um, there are various uh, sort of different anecdotes as to how that was arisen. But anyway, it was announced by the ministers here that we would have zero carbon homes by 2016. You know, except for the house that I showed you in outer space, we haven't built a zero carbon home uh, before that announcement. Um, uh, when it was announced in Germany that, uh, that the UK was going to have uh, uh, all new houses of zero carbon uh, at a conference, the Germans all just laughed hysterically. <laughs> Uh, because they knew how difficult it was to build them and they knew we wouldn't be able to do it. So what have we spent the last five years doing? You know, so the, the regulation is supposed to come into force in 2016. We spent the last two or three years redefining the word zero. <laughs> yeah. um, because zero is a, is, a, is a bad number to aim for. You know, it has a particular mathematical meaning. Um, but that hasn't stopped us now redefining what zero is. And so a zero carbon home is not going to be zero carbon. Um, it's, uh, and in fact, it will 
would be no better than actually we were planning to make new buildings anyway by that, by 2016. You know, we were planning to improve the regulations gradually anyway. Um, but somebody wanted to have a completely radical new policy which was going to uh, change things. And I would argue it's changed things for the worse because actually the plan was to switch uh, our interest in building regulations from new buildings and the zero carbon energy price to new buildings. Uh, and because we felt we'd actually done most of the cost effective things or were planning to do most cost effective things, what we needed to do was to make sure that actually we didn't tighten up the regulations but tightened up the policing of the regulations because it was quite clear that most of our buildings weren't even meeting the current building regulations, which is what that graph shows. Um, and actually, what we were planning to do was to move to regulations for the existing building stock, um, uh, which would have much, much bigger impacts. We hardly build any new buildings anyway here in the UK. Uh, the real win is, is, is doing things to existing buildings. So actually, it's, it's, it's been a complete diversion. It's made us, I think, a bit of a laughing stock. And actually, it's also really cheesed off the, uh, the innovative construction industry, because the innovative construction industry thought that zero carbon was going to be zero carbon, and they put a lot of effort into developing techniques and processes. And actually, they've wasted lots of money, you know, uh, because it isn't the regulations aren't going to be that tight, and they're not going to go and build zero carbon buildings when nobody else is. Yeah, and trust has been lost too. Trust has been completely lost, and I think you know this backtracking of things. How you overcome that within the normal four-year election process? I, I don't know. You need to have some long-term thinking. Um, now, the interesting thing is, I, I, I think it is an interesting development in the UK where we've we've committed to, you know, <laughs> reducing carbon emissions by 2020. We've set carbon budgets, which has an independent organisation, the Commission for Climate Change, that sets all of that up. And so maybe there are ways like that that we should use more for for, for other purposes. Um, and of course now we're talking about scrapping the building regulations anyway, completely. Um, not only for energy, but for, for, for the other things. I, I think so that's Can we postpone all this until the austerity is over? I don't... Well, we issues. can't... Yeah, um, that's right. Um, so what the other, the other questions? Uh, how imperative is detailed, the detailed dimension? Well, I think somebody has to know the detail. Um, uh, I don't think everybody needs to know the detail, but I think somebody needs to be on the back of the detail because the detail is phenomenally important. We were just about to, to initiate a very large um, element of the energy efficiency programme with assumptions which actually subsequently are proven that, that actually the payback period is going to be twice what we thought it was going to be and therefore the cost effectiveness of this technology was wrong. You know, we just happened to almost discover this by accident. Um, you know, so the detail is important, um, but whether everybody needs to know it, I, I don't think so. I think as long as the right people know it, and other people know how to use the information in the appropriate way, I think that's, that's, that's the, 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 the way around it. How do policy formula, how do uh, source for policy formulation, I think was, was a question which I feel completely unable to answer. I have no idea how people decide on policies. Um, uh, other than obviously it's a synthetic sort of accumulation of lots of information from lots of different people, lots of lobby or lobbying uh, going on. Um, the challenge in the energy demand side <coughs> compared to the energy supply side, I believe, is that the stakeholders in the energy supply um, uh, business are very clear and very focused. You know, we know who the stakeholders are. They're really six or seven utilities. Um, you know, they're big companies, uh, and you know they lobby in a way which is just very, very powerful. The stakeholders on the energy demand side are all of us. You know, and all the industries. You know, it's architect, <coughs> architects, project managers, uh, suppliers of insulation products, chemical suppliers all sorts of people, there, are, there isn't a clear unified voice. So when the government says we want uh, X nuclear power stations, the nuclear industry just gets together and says, well, if you want X nuclear power station, I'm afraid it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you far more than building a gas power station. 
that we ain't going to build any until you give us the money or somehow make it worth our while to do that. But nobody can do that on the demand side. It's, it's just too fragmented. There's no common unified voice which can, can speak up. Uh, so I think that's a, that is always a disadvantage on the, on the demand side of, of the energy problem. Okay, one last question. <laughs> Just reflect on what, uh, what you've been saying about the scale of the challenge. But I, I guess the previous example of energy was the move from coal gas to natural gas about 50 years ago, yeah. whatever that was, where virtually every house had to have all its appliances changed and so on in a very controlled way, which you couldn't do it randomly. I mean, are there any less? I mean, I think we're geared up now to do something on that scale that we were then. Or yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting there? because that analogy is used for the introduction of smart meters. Right which, you know, we, we are committed in the UK for every house to have its meter replaced with a smart meter by 2019, I think it is. Um, and that is a similar sort of thing to switching from coal gas to, um, to natural gas. And people are, are looking at the experience of that. Um, there's also the digital switchover for TV. Um, so I think there are lessons to be learned from, from, from history. The challenge for, for the refurbishment is, is a much, much bigger problem. It's, it's not just going into one house and doing one simple thing. Um, and even there, you know, we're talking about replacing a gas meter and an electricity meter. You know, how many people do we have who understand gas and electricity as a skilled workforce? There are very few people who do, to do that. Whereas previously we were just talking about, you know, somebody who was a gas skilled person going in changing one little bit of the gas compact. So even the smart metering thing is thought to be um, more complicated than the, uh, the, than the previous switch over. But yeah, I'm sure there are lessons we know. Thanks ever so much, Tesh. Uh, I'm very grateful. I think it's brought some of us, the macro and the micro, together uh, a little bit more closely. Much appreciate your time. Oh, thanks for your patience.